Hello everyone and welcome to the live broadcasting of King Arthur 2 the role playing war game. I'm Orshi from Neocore Games. And I'm Linda from <laughs> Neocore Games. <laughs> yes. And uh, today we're going to show you a segment of uh, the main campaign of King Arthur 2 the role playing war game. And uh, yeah, we will jump right into the campaign so we won't start from the very beginning. So sorry if we don't explain the, so uh, the story from the very beginning, but we thought we you just want to see something that's quite far already into the campaign. But if you want to see how it starts, then the game is already available on Steam and major digital download portals in English. So feel free to get it for yourselves. <laughs> but we will show you today uh, how chapter 3 looks like. Uh, and our designers are on the chat. So feel free to ask anything game related from them. So let's see the game. Greetings. Greetings, so, setting the sound and then we can load our save. My save, actually. Yeah, it's Linda's <laughs> save, so we will play a tyrant ruler. Because yeah. Linda is always tyrant. Tyrant and Christian. Yeah. Actually, just look at her. She looks like a tyrant, doesn't she? <laughs> no, no, I don't. But I am in the game. <laughs> it's because in real life I'm not. <laughs> yeah. So, this is the campaign map of King Arthur 2, the role-playing war game. So, just a few, sent few sentences about the game. Um, it has a turn-based campaign map that is divided into provinces that you can capture. And it has huge real-time battles with uh, masses clashing with each other. And it has lots of RPG elements everywhere, quests and heroes and units leveling up, carrying artifacts, and so on and so on. But you will see now, of course. So, as I said, we're quite far into the campaign already. Objectives, please. <laughs> yeah, so we have already completed uh, chapter one and chapter two, and right now we're doing chapter three. And uh, we will do the outcast uh, quest right now, uh, where we will have to meet Navia Sulla, the Empress. If you have played the prologue campaign, then you know who she is. If you don't, then play the prologue campaign, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's start the quest. The noble Navia Sulla, the wife of the self-proclaimed Emperor who rules the former Roman province of Ibaracum called King Arthur or his lawful heir to negotiate. The envoy assures you that the matter is very urgent, so you set off for the forests outside Sherwood to get to the camp of Navia. It takes time for you to find the camp in the dense wilderness. The camp is substantially bigger than you'd expected, and looks like a large hideout for refugees. There are several thousand tired and weary people there, but the mood is peaceful. The Empress waits for you in her pavilion, sitting behind a makeshift table. She's wearing a Roman dress, and her face is covered by a veil, which muffles her voice. She greets you in a friendly way, offers you a cup of wine, then asks about your journey. I haven't drunk wine for an eternity. She tells you bitterly. I know I should share the wine with you to assure you it is not poisoned, but since I am unable to do so, I shall not take offense if you decline my gesture of hospitality. You describe your travels in a few words, but soon you feel that you have to remind her you are here because she called you to discuss an urgent matter. She tells you she is not here on behalf of the Emperor. Navia is here because she needs help, and she is also a harbinger of danger. The former Roman province of Ibaracum is ruled by Emperor Septimus Sulla, who ascended the throne with the help of a mighty artifact. But his mind was ensnared by the same magical treasure that turned him into an insane and a cruel tyrant. Septimus Sulla thinks that the relic belonged to Hadrian, 
but this is just one sign of his madness. As a matter of fact, it is none other than a shard of a relic called the Grail. I read the notes of a guardian in the archives of Ibarakum after Sula killed the man. Septimus Sulla defends Ibarakum from the picked hordes and the Formorian plague with the power of the wall. But that power has its roots in black magic. Sulla has to sink deeper into depravity to keep the magic he needs alive. The wall was built by a Roman strategist and emperor, Hadrian, to defend the province from the attacks of the barbarians. The wall runs from east to west, straight through the entire land. Its capabilities are provided by colossi, which come alive when the Emperor calls them. To keep the magic of the wall alive, the Emperor pays the price in <coughs> Roman lives. So the Caracallas, an ancient Roman family, started a rebellion against him. The rebels are hiding from the troops of Septimus, but their situation is grim because Sulla's legions are invincible. The relic suggested to Septimus to open the gates to the other world, so he let the ghosts of the 9th legion possess the body of his legionaries. These soldiers are impossible to kill, because they are constantly returning from the realm of death. Furthermore, Ibarakum is not enough for the artifact. It forces Sulla to expand to the south, and he is preparing his legions for the campaign. I arrived here to warn you and to ask for help. The rebels are many, but only a few of them are warriors. The armies of Arthur may overcome the legions of the Emperor, but they will need the knowledge that the rebel leaders possess. The conversation is interrupted by voices from outside. A guard arrives and reports to the Empress that they have discovered a spy eavesdropping behind the tent. But he couldn't be caught. The scouts and a squad of soldiers are already after him. The Empress is thankful for your help, but she trusts her scouts, who know the area very well. But if you insist, you are free to send your man after the spy. When the interlude is over, the Empress apologizes. She tells you that this was a good demonstration of their weakness as refugees. The rebels are many, but only a few of them are warriors. The armies of Arthur may overcome the legions of the Emperor but they will need the knowledge that the rebel leaders possess. And uh, these represent that these are morality decisions. For that you will get morality points and unlock new bonuses. And as we are playing a tyrant ruler now, we shall make tyrant decisions. So we always want to get something out of, out of it. So we want to get benefits if we do something for anyone. So. What will my king gain from this war? Then I place my people at the mercy of King Arthur, and offer him the treasure saved from Rome. I shall be more than happy to join your army, and my treasure also belongs to you, as long as you use it in the fight against Caesar, or any enemy who rises against King Arthur. The Empress sweeps the veil from her face, and you suddenly realize she is a ghost. My husband woke me up from the dead in his insanity after I died. As an eternal being, I know the ways of magic, and fighting is not unknown to me either. After I returned as a ghost, and I realized my husband was insane, I tried to leave this world but I was forced to come back from death by an unknown force, just like the Ghost Legionaries. The Ghost Legions, like the Wall and the Relic, are also the tokens of his power.
The Emperor opened gates to the other world, and you have to close them. The first one is at a monastery to the north of here, in the southern part of the area ruled by the Formorians. Only the rebels can help you more, so you have to find them as soon as possible. Only the rebel leaders, the Caracallas, can answer this question. You have to find them as soon as possible. The Empress steps closer to the bundle of maps on the table, pulls out an enormous scroll, and unrolls it in front of you. No one knows their exact whereabouts. I only know that they are at the seashore west of Iburacum, in a province overrun by the Formorians. I order my troops to get ready to go, and then I prepare my faithful ghost warriors to fight on our side. You order your soldiers to defend the camp, and you leave with the Empress at your side. So we got a tiring morality point, and we uh, got experience points for our heroes, who because were participating Because of his decisions. Yes. So these are the quests, the adventure quests All King that Navius Sulla told us seems to be true. According to our spies, Septimus Sulla rules his so-called empire with immortal ghost legionaries, and demands terrible sacrifices from his people that he might defend the wall against the picked hordes. You must venture on three important quests to defeat him. You need to find the exiled Roman nobles. Also, you can't fight an army where the soldiers keep coming back from the dead, so you must close the gates whither they return. And the stronghold of Iboracum must fall. So now you know what we mean with interactive storytelling. So you are shaping the story and uh, the game tells you the story through these quests and you can make decisions and these decisions really have an effect uh, on the gameplay and the bonuses that you unlock. So if we take a look at the morality chart, you can see that now we have, uh, we are a Christian tyrant ruler right now. And we have points to Christian and tyrant, but we can also uh, play a rightful king and we can also follow the old faith and actually this means that on four different playthroughs you can choose different ways and then you will unlock different bonuses. So that is the morality chart, uh, what we kept from the first game, only the content is different. We also have diplomacy and you can establish diplomatic relations with neighboring provinces and their rulers. So for example, let's see this love affair. The son of King Idris has fallen in love with one of the maidens in York Castle. He dares not court her without his father's permission. And King Idris, for his part, wishes to hear your opinion before he speaks on the matter. So let's see <coughs> what we shall choose now. I'd rather send the damsel to the court of King Idris and let events run their course. So and we, that will... We yeah. have enough gold now, actually. So yeah, actually yeah. we have many, many gold pieces. <laughs> so we don't need it now, but we uh, desperately need des uh, reputation always with the neighboring provinces and their kings. So this increased our reputation with this ruler. So there are many options in diplomacy. You can ask for help, you can send gifts to their uh, birthday parties, and uh, you can also um, make trade agreements and so on and so on. We unlocked a new quest, and it is called Nobles in Exile, because the Empress told us that we have to find uh, the Caracallas to be able to defeat Septimus Sulla. If you want to know uh, the story of Septimus Sulla, then I really recommend to try the prologue campaign, because that is entirely about his story, how he became what he is right now, how he became the enemy of King Arthur. Yeah, and it's a very interesting thing that in the prologue chapter, 
uh, Septimus Sulla is your main hero, actually you are Septimus Sulla and now you are on the other side and he's one of your main enemies. Yes, exactly. So we have a new hero. Uh, we talked to the Empress, Navia Sulla, and she joined us. She's a sage. Yeah, she's a sage. So she has many spells, for example, the Venomous Curse or Fireball. Yeah. Uh, and she can increase the basic magic shield that our army has. But more of that later in the battles. Yeah. But now we don't have place for Mrs. Sulla. <laughs> yeah, Mrs. Sulla, yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's end the turn because the campaign map is turn based. So you can see that the campaign map is a lot bigger than the campaign map of the first game. Oh, we are attacked. So this is a Fomorian army. Fomorians are your main enemies in King Arthur 2 because uh, they somehow returned from another world, from the other world. Uh, because somebody, uh, somebody. Unleashed, <laughs> yeah, somebody <laughs> opened the gates to the other worlds and now the Fomorians are roaming everywhere um, in Britannia and they, they, destroy, they destroy everything. Yeah. So you can see the gates, uh, through these gates they come and spawn uh, You have lands. to close all of them. Yeah, that's one of the main objectives. Yeah. So, uh, you can always choose auto battle. Oh, I'm not correct. Not always. There are some <laughs> plot battles that you have to fight through because they're very important. Uh, we can also call them the boss battles because yeah. uh, you are fighting against uh, very a very, very powerful enemy with a very powerful arm army and that uh, battles are very important uh, regarding the story so you will have to fight them through. But such battles that are not uh, related to the main plot line, um, you can auto battle if you want but of course it's a lot more fun if you do it yourself <laughs> so uh, these are the leader fangs uh, creeper hound and screech and we have the possessed units and the giants so let's start a battle So as I said, we have real-time battles, huge real-time battles, and we have a new engine for King Arthur 2. And that means that it looks a lot better. In the beginning of every battle, if you let the game, then the game will um, drive you through uh, the entire battlefield showing you the locations that you can capture. So this is neither gate that spawns Fomorian armies if it's captured by the Fomorians. So you can capture these locations and they will grant you different bonuses. Yeah. And you can uh, skip this part of the battle with an escape, but I guess that it looks cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's a typical Fomorian battlefield. <coughs> yeah, it's full of it's demonic spikes. Demonic and yes. the weather is very demonic. Because they change radically the terrain. Yeah, so it's the mark of their destruction, these demonic spikes that you... You can also see them uh, on the campaign map, so... And of course, the battle maps always represent the actual uh, terrain. I mean, not exactly, but very similarly to the province, um, to the terrain of the province. So, if you are fighting your battle on a Fomorian infested land, then it will of course show on the battlefield as well. So, we have three units of flying talent folks. So, we will be able to fly in the air. So these are the talent folk units. Yeah. And this is our army. As you can see you can get really really close to your units. Look them in the eye. See how they look like if they're ready for the fight. It's one of your heroes. Yes, that's Sir Linden.
and that's the, the enemy army. army. Yes. The Fomorians. Let's see the, the giants. Forces. I want to see the giants. You want to see the giants? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Sorry, Arshi, it's not about you. <laughs> uh, it's a shame. <laughs> okay, so. so do you like them? Okay. They look nice, yeah? Let's be honest, everybody is curious about the giants, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Okay, so let's and see the flying, flying monsters. Units. Yes, the Screech. So yeah. there are many uh, Screech beasts in one unit, but they are quite easy to take down, so they are not that lethal. So let's start a battle. How yeah. about this? Okay, I'll explain a little bit. Um, what you see on the top corners, uh, those are your magic shields. I mean, to the left, it's your magic shield, and to the right, that's the enemy magic shield. In the middle, you will see an eye, and uh, in the top, and uh, that is the strategic settings. Yeah. So, you can set a lot of things, customize what you want to see and what you don't want to see. You can highlight the arrows if you want to see them better, or you can use unit selects to see the units even, even in the forest. And you can also uh, turn on the transparent forest, and I think we have it turned on, so maybe we can yeah. show you how it works. I, I love that, actually. I think yeah. it's cool. Me too. <laughs> transparent forest uh, means that the game collapses the forest uh, as you go there, so your units are always visible to you so you don't lose control. But of course you can turn this off if you don't like it, but I think that's cool. Okay, so we have a slow spell that is very useful because... Okay, slow and archers. Slow spell and the archers are a very good combo because if you slow the enemy down, then you can attack them with the archers a lot more, a lot more, and then they will suffer a lot more damage, of course. So that's a good combo, for example. And the archers and flying units as well. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, and spells are very effective against flying units. Okay, so I mentioned the magic shield in the top corners. Uh, right now, the enemy is very busy destroying our magic shield. Uh, now it's just above the low level. Uh, that means that it protects us from low-level spells, because every, every spell has its level. And the enemy shield is above normal level, so we have to use high-level spells, or low on, and normal-level uh, spells will only decrease the enemy shield. And after we penetrated the shield to normal level, under normal level, then we can use normal spells against them, and they will uh, take effect and they will do damage to the enemy. We have also introduced uh, the casting time, and that means that most powerful spells uh, take time to cast. For example, the fireball. It has 10 seconds of casting time, and you can use them, use it both on uh, flying and both on ground units. But they are moving out there, and 10 seconds is more than enough to... Um, to miss, miss the enemy with a fireball. But with the flying monsters, uh, they affect the units and not the territory. But on the ground, if you, if you use it on the ground, then it has a territorial effect. So, are we capturing locations? Yes. yes. We have so. already captured two locations. One demon tower and one monolith that will raise the spell penetration level of our spells. And that's good, because the enemy shield is still above normal, because Linda is not destroying it too effectively right now. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> yes, but our shield is, is running dangerous for low. Oh, we have a blast as well. What is this penetration level? It's normal. It's about penetration. No, it's very, very high. high. So Sorry. how about doing that? Oh, we didn't see that. But there was a blast. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe next time. 
So uh, to the left you will always get your notifications so you will know what is happening on the battlefield even if you don't pay attention to every little detail because all the spells uh, that were cast uh, you will get a message on the left side and you will get a message if uh, if the enemy hero is captured and so on and so on and of course you will get of course you will get uh, a notification if the enemy hero starts casting a spell that requires casting time and that means that you will have to act fast to interrupt him because you can interrupt those spells that have a casting time so you can do that with your flying units with archers or with different spells so that don't have a costing time of course so we have won the battle that was quick yeah <laughs> what difficulty level are we playing on not nightmare <laughs> not nightmare so which is it then <laughs> it's not normal normal okay yeah. sorry for that <laughs> yeah, Linda because of the presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Linda Norman plays on Nightmare, so yeah. <laughs> that is why she's so good. <laughs> so, this is the result of our big fight. And we have received an artifact. So, as you see, after quests and battles, you will get sometimes gold, sometimes artifacts, and sometimes both. You can also forge new artifacts. I don't know if we have already captured an artifact for the oh, I long to leave the glittering city and be on my way to find my master. I'm sure the council would be glad to play these ridiculous games with me for an eternity. But once they see that I have completed all their tasks, they must grant my wishes for a change. They have granted me permission to fight Nimue in a challenge of spirit and will. I am about to enter her fading tower, where I will make her beg before I allow her to give me my answers. So that was Morgana Le Fay. She is also a main hero, an army leading hero. Ready to serve. Yes. That's her. Yeah. And we will go for the Rampage of the Ancili uh, battle quest. Actually, Morgan of Fay is uh, half human and half she. So she is. And she is not a nice girl. Not a nice girl, but she has interest in Very serving powerful. King Arthur right now. Yeah. So let's click on the recruitment, fill up our ranks. Great. So you can also recruit new units. And William Pendragon will go for the next quest. On my way. <coughs> Sorry. Oh yeah. On my way. Out of his movement points. Oh yeah. Uh, before we end the turn, yeah, I would like to show everyone how you can arrange marriages because that is what you can do in King Arthur Two as well. <laughs> and uh, no, William Pendragon cannot be married. And Sir Agarain is already married. <laughs> so here comes the special um, funny thing. <laughs> yeah, our yeah. Uh, our voice guy is a funny guy. So if you give a wife uh, to one of your he heroes... He's one of our bosses, so we <laughs> couldn't do anything against this. Yeah. We, no, but I think it's fun. So if you <laughs> <laughs> give a wife to one of your heroes, that is what happens. Let's... Ready to serve. <laughs> Yeah, I think that is good. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, you think so. yeah, we can do it Ready again. Ready to serve. Yeah, great. Oh, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Ready to serve. Okay, so let's end the turn. I just wanted to show you that. <laughs> yeah, but of course marriage has its disadvantages as well. Because the ladies also have negative traits. So you will have to be very careful who you marry your heroes to. Yeah. 